going to uh, hear from God's word now. Good morning, everybody. So a few verses from uh, 1 John 3. We've been looking at 1 John uh, yesterday, yesterday evening, and we'll go on and take a final look tomorrow as well. Beginning at verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And this is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. We're going to skip to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know he lives in us, and we know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear Lord, as we come to your word this morning, uh, just would you uh, give us a fresh insight into you? into your love for us, into your character. Just speak to our hearts and minds and souls, Lord, that we might walk ever closer with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. So I've broken this into two sections. Uh, We'll look at the first section, verses 1 to 6, first of all. I love that. John writes, Oh, what great love the Father has lavished on us. I love that John's language here conveys such a richness. You know, he could just simply have written, see what great love the Father has, that we should be called children of God. And that would still have made sense, wouldn't it? It would still have conveyed that we are very loved. But this word lavished, I don't know about you, but it's not a word that I use very often uh, when I describe things. It's not a word that I see uh, particularly used in the media uh, or in uh, much writing, which perhaps, uh, because it isn't used so much nowadays, when we do read it, it just makes so much more um, a striking and special um, attention to that thing which it describes Lavish, the world l- word lavish, it's reserved for the best, isn't it? The absolute finest, the most bountiful, the most beautiful, the most extraordinary that we experience in life. And wow, God's love is lavished on us. That's the kind of love that God lavishes on us. It's the kind of love that we run out of words to describe God's love is beyond description. And right now, in this room, in our lives, God is loving each and every single one of us lavishly in exactly that way, beyond words, beyond our understanding. And he loves us so much that he calls us his children. It's very easy to say that, 
very easy then just to kind of run on past that, but actually just let that sink in for a moment. We are his children, each and every single one of us. Each and every single one of us in this moment, in this day, is lavishly loved by God. I met on Wednesday someone that I hadn't seen for a very long time, so we had just a very little sort of catch-up, and I found myself asking them about their children. Uh, and I was told that their daughter now has four children. Last time I saw her, she was a teenager. I was kind of like, well, she's been busy. Um, <laughs> so she has four children, and she also has a foster child as well. You kind of think that four children might be plenty for somebody. Um, I kind of think, you know, I've only got two hands, uh, you know. <laughs> four children, five children now, because she is fostering. I have enormous respect for those people who foster and those people who adopt children. It's not an easy role. There's an awful lot that is unseen before fostering or adoption even begins uh, for the family to be checked through and to make sure that things are going to go well and that they are the right people, that they have the right kind of love before a child becomes part of their household. No one's obliged to care for others in that way. It's a really special thing, isn't it? These families choose, they actively, positively choose uh, to um, be those people, to be that family uh, to these youngsters. And sometimes it's for a short time, sometimes it's for many, many years. But no matter the length of their relationship, foster families and adoptive families positively choose to lavish their love upon their children. They give strangers the privilege of becoming part of their family. They count them as their children. But even this illustration of my friend's daughter, when we compare uh, this to God's love and how we've been into our do uh, adopted into God's family and God calls us his children, even this illustration of family adoption pales into significance compared to the lavish love that God has for us the way that he has adopted us into his family, the way that he has our name written on his hand and on his heart. Father's love changes everything. It changes us. It transforms us. And we become different people as we are transformed into Christ-likeness. We become the best version of ourselves that we could possibly be this side of eternity. And as that transformation takes place, we become less worldly. You'd kind of expect that, wouldn't you? As we become more Christ-like, we become less worldly. There's kind of an exchange that goes on. So much so that John writes that the world doesn't recognize us. I wonder if you ever have any of those moments where just people think you're weird because of the way that you have reacted. Good. I'm glad that you do, because that means that you are less worldly. That moment when somebody gives you too much change, it's not happened to me for a long time because I don't really have any money anymore <laughs> in my hand. So those moments kind of have disappeared a bit. But those moments when someone's given you too much change and you hand it back, <laughs> why are you giving me back that money when you could have kept it for yourself? Those little moments when our values, cr our Christ-likeness, uh, kind of jars with society and, and what would be expected. Of course, it shouldn't be a surprise when those moments uh, jar uh, because um, the world doesn't recognize us and, of course, it didn't recognize the Lord either. So as we grow to become more like him, we will experience things in life uh, that uh, the Lord experienced, even though he is constantly um, revealing himself in the world. The world still doesn't recognize him. And even though we're growing to be more like Jesus, we'll never truly attain, will we, Christ-likeness until Christ actually appears himself again. And yet that is our hope. Our hope is that uh, one day that we will see him as he really is, uh, not uh, sort of veiled as we see him now, but revealed fully in all his glory, in all his splendor, in all his majesty. We don't have enough descriptive words, do we, for our hope of what we will see when Christ is revealed. But one day, we were talking about looking in the eye of the Lord yesterday uh, and imagining that John, the writer of this, had looked into Jesus' eyes and looked into his face and sat at his feet. 
one day that will be our privilege that we will look into the face of the Lord, that we will sit at his feet, that we will stand in his presence and worship him for all eternity. And only then we will really see him as he is. And only then will we be fully transformed into the people uh, that the Lord intended us to be before the beginning of time. And then there's this incredible uh, truth in verse 3. Don't worry, not every verse is going to take this long. Verse 3, where's it gone in my Bible? All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Even this longing, this hope of seeing Jesus as he is fully uh, going to be, uh, makes us purer. It's amazing, isn't it? Just our wanting to see the Lord makes us purer. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit in our lives. And then after verse 3, the thing is we move on to verse 4 and 5. And you might read verse 4 and 5, or you might have just heard them a moment ago and thought, oh, actually, that's just spoilt it now. Everyone who sins breaks the law. We're having a lovely time with the Lord and thinking about being pure and uh, being so very loved and being la- have his love lav- lavished on us. And then John writes about this and makes it all sad again. Everybody who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who keeps on sinning uh, continues. Hang on, read it properly, Sandy. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And that's our problem, isn't it? Because we read those words that John has written and immediately the condemnation appears and we're kind of taken from that moment of, oh, we are lavishly loved to, oh, I'm a miserable sinner, Lord. That is just our kind of default thinking very often, isn't it? We read these words as personal condemnation. But, you know, actually, if we were to take off the lens of condemnation and see these words as John had written them, as John intended them to be received, we see that they are just wise and true words. Verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. Isn't that the truth? We know that. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Yeah, sin is lawlessness. When we're not following God's law then that's walking away from it and with lawlessness. Verse 5, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Why do we think that's bad news? That's good news. That's what Jesus came to do and what he has done at the cross. He took away our sins. A bit more truth here. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Actually, no one who lives on him in him keeps on sinning. It's this phrase, keeps on sinning, that's really important just to understand. Keeps on sinning is willfully living apart from God's law. And I don't think I know a Christian who willfully lives apart from God's law. Nobody comes to Christ and then rejects the law, uh, loving God, loving others. All I know uh, that are um, striving to keep God's laws, to love God, to love others. Yes, we get it wrong. We don't love the Lord our God all of the time with our heart and soul and mind and strength. We don't love our neighbours as ourselves. And we know that. But the thing is that our heart recognises that. Our heart helps us to recognise that we are not able to do that. And then that is what leads us to saying sorry and wanting to love people better, wanting to God love God more. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's this right understanding of this phrase keeps on sinning. It's about a willful turning away from God's law, a willful turning away from God. Um, and we, I think, as Christians, have turned our back when we repented of our sins and faced towards the Lord. And our hearts help us, our hearts help us to be able to understand uh, just uh, when we have strayed, when we have sinned. Now, we're going to jump over verses 7 to 15, and you might look at those and later on go, 
all sand issues, just disregarded God's word. Uh, but actually, John, in his writing, is a little bit like each one of us. Uh, he repeats himself. And so we looked at this kind of in um, this area yesterday. If you want to think about that and you weren't here yesterday, you can pick it up uh, because it's all online. So it's not just that I am blatantly sort of cutting something out of God's word, uh, but I want to move on from that which we spoke about yesterday to something different today. So let's jump to verses 16 to 18 or 16 to the end. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. What a great definition of love that John has given us. Actions as well as words and speech. And then we have verse 19, which again, John is reassuring us and encouraging us, as he has been doing uh, throughout the previous uh, couple of chapters. He writes, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If you want to have your hearts at rest in God's presence, this is how we know how to set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, immediately we jump to kind of, oh, self-condemnation again. If our hearts condemn us, which they do, don't they, all of the time, we just seem to have that default setting. But do you know, when our your hearts are uh, condemning us, God is greater than our hearts he already knows everything. He knows every detail of our lives, every interaction, every relationship, uh, every moment of our day. And his heart is bigger than that. I think that's really good. See, this is a, a litmus paper test of how we're going with following Jesus and being transformed, being more like him. This is not how we know that we belong to the truth, how we set our hearts at rest. If our hearts condemn us, this is natural. But it's not natural, and it's not good for us to get stuck in the condemnation phase. Rather, we should be using it to be prompted to handle in our sin in the way that God has gifted to us. He has gifted us the precious gift of the cross. He has gifted to us the precious life of his son, Jesus Christ, so that we might uh, be free from sin. If our hearts condemn us, if we realize that we've sinned, we need to go on to recognize that God is greater than our hearts. He already knows everything about us, and remember, he still lavishly loves us. How amazing is that? This is how we know what love is. Verse 16, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's a gift. That's the gift of life, isn't it, for us? You know, when we bring our sins to the cross, when we say sorry, when we repent of them, when we turn away from them, we are fully restored into relationship with the Lord. And that is the truth because that's what he's told us. We are forgiven of that thing which our heart condemned of us. Uh, it's like um, our, our, yeah, just our slate is wiped absolutely clean. There is no mark of what that sin was. And if God no longer condemns us when we have said sorry for those things that we have done wrong, who are we to condemn ourselves? If God has forgiven us and no longer condemns us when we have said sorry for our sins, who are we to condemn ourselves? Romans 8, 1 and, true, 1 and 2. Isn't this the truth? Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I've got to read that again. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's you and 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 you, and everybody listening, and me. There is no condemnation, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set us free from the law of sin and death. 
It's amazing. And dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Amazing. We have confidence before God. End of chapter 2 last night, we were thinking about uh, John's words. He said, Now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Confident and unashamed. That's how God wants us to stand before him at his coming. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. This is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gives us. We know it by the spirit he gives us. We often think we know it and we set great store on feeling God. And it's great to feel God and to feel him close to us and we love that. But we do need to remember that we are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. The heart and the soul are those areas of our lives, our bodies, at which our beings, which feel God, which feel God's presence. And actually, even when we're not feeling God's presence, because sometimes our feelings are not, uh, you know, they kind of don't tell us the truth, uh, we should know with our minds and with our strength, God's promises that he is with us. Even if we don't feel him, God is with us. God doesn't lie. He tells the truth. He is with us. So loving God also with our mind and with our strength, that strength to believe those promises and keep coming back to Scripture and keep reading them, even when we don't feel God's presence in our lives, we can know with certainty and trust his promise that he is with us. That's the truth until the very end of time. So a summary of all of this, we are the children of God. We have our hope set on him. And when we have our hope set on him, that very hope purifies us. We know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for each one of us. And we've been reminded by John, and I think it's a really important reminder, how to set our hearts at rest and that there is now condem no, no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Amen.